And thanks to the organizers for the invitation and, and for everyone uh, who, who's online and in person for attending the talk. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but glad to be here at least uh, virtually. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a project that we did on quantum machine learning last year. And this was joint work uh, done between IonQ and the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go, slides changing. Okay, before uh, I begin the talk, uh, the lawyers at my company asked me to flash the statement, uh, uh, flash this, <laughs> because IMQ actually went public. So if you have more interest uh, about uh, this, um, this document on forward-looking statements, you can, um, you can find it on our website. <laughs> um, the work that I'm going to talk about is based uh, on this paper that we wrote last year. And uh, here's the archive number, if anyone is interested in taking a further look. And uh, the work is called uh, Generative Learning of Joint Probability Distribution Functions. And it's basically about how you can do multivariate analysis or the analysis of the joint uh, distribution of many variables on a quantum computer. So now understanding the statistical relationship between random variables is uh, obviously critical to any kind of data-based analysis and decision-making that, uh, uh, that is done across, uh, any indus uh, across any industry or engineering discipline, right? And so, of course, uh, examples of diverse applications can include uh, activities in finance, such as risk management and portfolio optimization, or um, uh, when you're kind of doing any kind of reliability analysis of a complex engineering system, uh, if you want to re uh, recommend ads or movies, uh, uh, for example, or you're doing climate research, medical imaging, etc. And traditionally, um, uh, let's say you have a data set of two variables. Um, uh, of one, the very simplest thing you can do to understand the relationship between the variables is to fit some kind of single parameter correlation function to that, right? Uh, but these are good for when you have, let's say, monotonic dependence between two variables, but they're not really useful for uh, real data. And especially when you have data from financial markets um, or reliability studies, there may not even be very much correlation in the bulk of the data, but instead there may be correlation in the extreme deviations, um, such as you know, when you have an, a black swan event, for example. And so uh, just to visualize this a little bit, on the left I have an example of a two uh, two dimensional uh, gaussian distribution right and so if you if you sample from that uh, distribution you get uh, points that look uh, uh, like this these shown in the middle and then um, uh, uh, if if you look at the distribution uh, of each of the individual variables those are known as the marginal distributions and so an example of this is uh, let's say the returns on the stock prices of uh, microsoft and apple Right over an eight-year period, so those, so just those two, uh, uh, just th those two variables. If you sample from their joint distribution, they give you, uh, they give you a picture that looks like that, the one on the right. So now, in uh, statistics and probability theory, a common way to study these uh, joint distributions is through the use of popular functions, ex especially in finance. And what are copular functions? They are the multivariate uh, CDF or cumulative density function of uniform marginals. And basically what they allow you to do is, let's say you have a joint probability distribution. What they, it, it allows you to uh, basically express the joint distribution function as a combination of marginal distributions that have no correlation to each other. They just exist by themselves plus a function which couples them together. And this is a function that couples them together is known as the copula. Um, and uh, it's based, uh, the proof uh, that this thing is, that this, that this is possible is based on the probability integral transform, which states that the CDF of, uh, the CDF of, a, uh, of a random variable um, is actually another random variable which has a uniform marginal, uh, 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 sorry, is another random variable which is a uniform 
uh, which is uniformly distributed. Um, and uh, then there's a theorem called Sklar's theorem, which says that the multivariate, any multivariate distribution can be written as a copula of the CDF of the marginals, right? Um, and our main insight in this paper was that these copula functions, which are very, very fundamental to probability uh, theory and statistic, uh, probability and statistics can actually exactly, any copula can be represented by a maximally entangled quantum state. Right, so here, uh, if you write down a quantum state that looks like this, right, uh, where you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, se several, uh, uh, se let's say these u1 through u d are uh, uh, represent registers of qubits, right, and then e inside each register you have a uniformly distributed, uh, uh, uniformly distributed quantum state. Right, which by itself is uniformly distributed, then you have some overall uh, overall density function for the entire state. So th this is known as a copula, th this is a maximally entangled quantum state, but it is also a copula function. And thus we can map the study of multivariate uh, distributions to the study of maximally entangled quantum states. Now, if you just go and look on, look on Wikipedia uh, about how copulas are used, um, uh, you, you see a bunch of different ap applications in different fields. And basically, uh, the, the way that they're used classically is, uh, uh, let's say you have a data set, you identify some kind of copula function that seems to model the data well, and then you use it for analysis. And mostly, most of the widely used copula formulas right, uh, try to capture the correlation with one or few parameters. But what's the problem with that, right? Where does this traditional copula analysis fail? So let's say uh, you have uh, an uh, example here where you have the scatter plot of uh, the returns, again, of two assets, let's say, in the financial market. What you'll find is that if you try to fit it with using what is one of, uh, using the simplest copula, which is known as the Gaussian copula, um, and which is very popular because it is tractable, you'll actually miss most of the rare events. You won't be able to capture events in the tail. And, and this can actually be quite uh, dangerous because uh, you know, th there are black swan events like the pandemic, right? And if you miss it, then, uh, then you're not going to be able to analyze the risk from those kind of events. So how can you fix this? Well, one thing traditionally people did in class on the classical side is instead of using simple copulas like Gaussian copula, you use more sophisticated formulae, right? So you can use this Archimedean copulas or um, I, um, you know even more complicated things. But uh, the problem with that is it's very very with these kind of uh, sophisticated formulae is that it's very very hard to scale them to higher dimensions. The the, the formulae are just not tractable tractable anymore. And then the more modern thing to do is, uh, is use machine learning for it, right? So basically here you're trying to learn a probability distribution and you, uh, you, can, uh, you can frame that as a generative machine learning problem where you have a data set uh, and you're trying to learn the distribution over the variables in the data set. And so you can train, for example, what's known as a GAN or generative adver adversarial network in which you set up a two player minimax game between uh, two neural networks, um, one called the generator and the, then the other called the discriminator. And then the generator tries to, uh, uh, tries to produce data uh, that uh, looks as close to the real data as possible in an effort to fool the discriminator while the discriminator is trying to you know, uh, classify uh, the real data as real and the fake data as fake. So, uh, so, so the modern approach uh, would be to uh, set up this uh, 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 generative machine learning uh, model to, um, uh, to model a complex high dimensional data set. Um, and so, so again here, uh, like I was telling you, uh, uh, this is what a GAN looks like, right? You have a, a two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator, and then this two player game that is set up with them, uh, set up using them. And then uh, what you can do is uh, instead of a cl classical GAN, what we did in this work is use a quantum GAN in which the only, everything would remain the same. Only thing we changed is this upper block here where instead of uh, using a classical neural network as a generator, we used a quantum uh, variational circuit as a generator. 
right? Um, uh, and the goal uh, was to see if, if this kind of setup, right, if this kind of quantum generative training can work to model uh, joint probability distributions better than a classical, uh, classical uh, uh, learning model. Now, uh, now uh, so I told you that this, this upper, uh, this block on the upper left here will be a, a, a quantum variational circuit, but what kind of architecture should we adopt for that quantum variational circuit? Now, our goal is to capture the correlations between let's say two variables to begin with, right? Sim uh, uh, simplest uh, uh, joint probability distribution will be one or two variables. So we want to capture the correlation between two variables. So um, how do you create correlation between two variables in quantum uh, compute uh, with qubits, let's say, right? So the simplest, uh, the simplest way to do that is to just create a bell pair, right? So simplest correlated state you can think of is just a bell pair. And we know a very, very simple circuit to create that using this Hadamar than C0 gate. Now, if you have, uh, now think about what you need to create uh, a uniform distribution, uh, uh, sorry, think about what you need to create uh, a joint probability distribution of two variables in which uh, uh, each of the variables is uniformly distributed, but also there is perfect correlation between the two variables, right? So all you would do for this is to create, uh, uh, create several bell, bell pairs and distribute them between two different registers, right? And so then you will get a state that looks like the one here, right? Uh, so each it, it, within each register, right? There's equal probability of measuring any bit string and whatever you measure in register A, you'll also measure in register B, right? So this is, um, so basically when you distribute bell states between two registers, you're getting two, uh, you, you're getting a perfectly correlated uh, uh, uniform distributions in, uh, in two registers, right? Now, um, if as a next step, once you've uh, distributed these bell states, then you act unitaries locally on each of these bell states, uh, what happens, right? Uh, now, before you apply these unitaries, the reduced density matrix of each register was just an identity operation, right? And applying unitaries locally to each register doesn't, doesn't change the reduced density matrix in each register, right? Since u dagger i u is still i. And but what it does is it does change the correlations between those two registers, right? And so now this answers over here because UA and UB can then just uh, be uh, just be any unitaries that you can train, right? They can be parameterized by some set of angles that can then be uh, set as you wish. And this this answers is representing the the discretized version of a popular function, which in our paper we actually uh, christened as a copula with a Q. Um, uh, uh, and this is completely general, right? Uh, I haven't made any kind of restrictions on what kind of uh, uh, copulas this can model. Um, this is completely general. Now, uh, we use this kind of, this, this answer uh, to train, uh, train a probability distribution that consisted of uh, 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 Two variables, which were the uh, the uh, stock the returns on the stock prices of uh, Microsoft and Apple, and the target distribution is uh, shown over here. And we we did an initial study around how well uh, training this uh, ansatz uh, using different kinds of quantum models. Uh, you know, we, we used a quantum GAN as well as a quantum circuit born machine. How this did, and we had some very interesting findings. So first thing we found is that uh, quantum algorithms outperformed classical methods in both the accuracy of, um, of uh, modeling the distribution as well as successful convergence to the right model. So um, the quantum GANs uh, converged, when you're training them, they converge 100% of the time. And the classical GANs only converge about 40% of the time. We also observed that the quantum algorithm and quantum algorithms can learn much, much, uh, much faster. By faster, I mean that uh, they can train with much fewer iterations, uh, uh, and uh, they can train with. They can converge. Uh, their training can converge with much fewer iterations, and they are way more superior in modeling the rare events in the tail of the distribution. 
So if you look at, uh, so, so this was uh, on the right, I'm showing chaining with six qubits, right? And the target distribution is the one in orange there. And if you see the classical GAN, where we made the restriction that the classical GAN had the same number of parameters as the quantum GAN uh, or the quantum models. And it, uh, with few parameters, it completely misses events in the tail of the distribution, but the quantum models do, even with few parameters, capture events in the tail. And we did this not only in simulation, but we also did it in experiment, right? And we, at the time, uh, you know, we were calling it the cloud quantum computers from IMQ and the next generation quantum computers from IMQ. And they both, even in experiment, you could train the models, the quantum models. Uh, this was, um, uh, this was done on six qubits. You could train, even in experiment, you could train the quantum models to pass a statistical test known as this KS test uh, better than the classically trained neural network. Now, uh, where does the quantum advantage in this case come, come from? So, so there are a couple of, uh, couple of uh, simple ways to think about this. So one is that the space of uh, distributions that can be modeled uh, quantumly efficiently is larger than the space of distributions that can be sampled from quantumly, uh, that can be sampled from classically efficiently, right? Now, another source of advantage you can think about, uh, another source of advantage also comes from Bell's theorem. So um, uh, Bell's theorem states that, let's say you have, uh, uh, you have an entangled uh, uh, Bell, uh, so Bell's theorem states that, let's say you have a Bell state and you distribute it uh, to, uh, to two people, let's say Alice and Bob, right? And then Alice and Bob uh, perform measurements on those states, uh, uh, Right, and these measurements give you uh, the variables x and y, and those measurements are conditioned on uh, some other uh, lo locally known variables to them, which are a and b. Then um, uh, you cannot reproduce uh, those measurements by classical means uh, without communication between a and b. Right. Now, if you instead of just distributing one bell pair between Alice and Bob. If you distribute n bell pairs, right, then uh, there's a theorem that says you would need an exponential amount of communication between Alice and Bob to reproduce those uh, uh, reproduce those correlations, right? And then using this, you can go on to argue that if you wanted, uh, so if you uh, if you wanted to uh, simulate or reproduce the training of the quantum circuit with the answers that I'd shown, right? If you wanted to do that classically, right? You would new, need a, a neural network, Let, let's say for, uh, for instance, uh, the commonly used feed forward neural network. So you, if that feed forward neural network had a, a finite width, the number of layers in that neural network would have to scale exponentially in N to simulate the, the training of the, on the quantum, uh, of the quantum variational circuit. Right, and then, um, and, and so you can show that, uh, that because of this, you should expect to have exponential advantage in the expressivity of the answers. Uh, 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 and so you can basically ultimately generate, ultimately sample more efficiently from, uh, uh, from certain probability distributions, which in turn may possibly uh, uh, capture much better the correlations in a target data set. So um, finally, I want to conclude with an outlook. Um, so the application areas for copulas are broad in financial and other industries, um, whether it's uh, areas in finance like risk management and portfolio optimization or more broadly in uh, other kinds of engineering. Um, uh, we, are, uh, we are very, very excited about applying it to all these different areas. Um, and then uh, one of the key insights was uh, of this work was that um, quantum models can provide much more efficient ways to produce probability distributions that can capture key features of uh, a target data set. Um, and since the um, uh, since this is still a variational algorithm, you require uh, relatively low circuit depths to start to access probability distributions that are hard to access classically. And it, it, 
and and it's an algorithm that's based on sampling from some kind of distribution, right? And um, uh, that uh, and sam sampling from a hard probability distribution was also uh, the first area where we saw quantum supremacy, right? And and, and so so we do think that this could be an area for first practical quantum advantage. So I will end here and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. So are there any questions in the room? <laughs> also, are you checking the questions online as well? Uh, will we be able to put up the... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Ashley, please go ahead. Um, so just maybe it's a sort of silly question, but the uh, when we put up the quantum circuit where you prepare the uh, entire state, and then you have these unitaries acting on either side. But why do you need unitaries on both sides? Because isn't if you do one on one side, then you get the transpose unitary out on the other anyway? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, even if you had it on one side, it would still work. Yes. Uh, but uh, but uh, but um, if you have uh, so. You know, if you just have two variables, even if you just have it on one uh, one of the registers, it will work, right? But let's say you had three variables. So instead of starting with Bell states, right, you would start with GHZ states, right? And then you would have, um, you know, you would have to have unit trees on at least two out of the three variables. So basically, if you had like an N, N, um, N variable co copula, you would need uh, to act unit trees on N minus one of the registers. I did have one question, if, if anyone else hasn't. So with this link to Bell non-locality, there you really need inputs. I mean, on the two sides, it's, it's crucial that there are different choices to be made. But in this picture, when you've just got the unitaries, it, it seems that there's no, like, it seems that the A and the B, what, what, what role did this A and the B play in, in, in this connection? Yeah. So if you, if you think about... Um... Uh, if you think about how uh, how the training of the quantum uh, uh, the quantum circuit or quantum I don't want to call it quantum neural network but but let's say that this quantum variational circuit looks like right um, you're first uh, you're first generating these bell states right um, uh, so so let's say uh, you know let's say on the left here you're representing the register A on the or the right here you are you're uh, representing the register B. Right, and you've basically just distributed Bell states between them. Then that A and B is, you can think about it as the inputs provided by the classical optimizer to those registers A and B, right? And then X, X and Y are, uh, uh, are the measurements that are made, uh, are the measurements that are made, right? And to reproduce that classically, you would, you would, not, you would need communication between kind of these registers A and B, right? And that communication would have to be exponential. Thank you. That, that's great. Um, oh, I can see another question. Yes. So, um, how does the the results you have on advantage? How do they depend on the choice of data set? Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I've heard this many times, right? Like, how do you know that quantum correlations are useful for a particular data set? And that's very hard to say, right? But uh, but what you can say is that um, uh, it expands the space of data sets that you can model efficiently, right? That you can definitely say. And then you can think about, um, let's say if you have some financial data set or uh, data set or, or other very complex data set, right? That is, uh, you know, the correlations in that data set arise from a very, very complex <coughs> network of interactions, right? Um, it's not necessary that they will be efficiently modeled by classical neural networks, you, you, you can't prove that either, right? So what all you can say is that it expands the space of, uh, of uh, uh, the space of data that can be modeled, uh, right? So it provides you with an alternative to the traditional uh, learning architecture or traditional learning models, yeah. Does it mean that it's quantum gans subsume completely the classical ones? So, I yeah, I would not say they substitute, but they, but they, but they can, um, they're addition, 
right? There addition to the possible techniques you can use. It's just an introduction. Uh, so I guess uh, with the with the quantum down, you're gonna get certain distributions in the model, and with the classical one, others. So I mean, uh, it would be interesting to know how these compare and whether they overlap, uh, whether there's the distributions for which classical is better than quantum or the other way around. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, and that and that's um, that's a good question, and it's it's I I think a natural next step to this work to actually explore that more in depth. Um, um, we have so far not uh, done that in any rigorous way, but it's certainly an interesting next step. Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we will give you one final round of applause.